Hello Interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. Uh, today I'm going to be taking a look at the Secure SQD60 soldering iron. Uh, I've actually been sitting on this one for a while now and it's about time I got around to showing it to you guys. I've done some testing with this thing already so I'll take it out of the box and show, show you what you get. Ah. As you can see the soldering iron tip on this one is a little bit used already. Um, so inside we get we get the D60 handle, um, a soldering iron tip. In this case, I requested a TSD24 tip, um, which is a wedge style chip. And I find that these are um, these are my preferred sort of all rounder tips. I quite like these a lot. Um, I'm not sure if you can always select what it comes with, but if you do get the choice, I highly recommend a D24 as just a default go-to tip. But ultimately, you're going to end up having a couple anyway. And I'll tell you more about the, the various tips and stuff in a minute when we get started with the demo. So ugh, here is the iron itself, which again, we'll take a closer look at in a moment. Then also in the box, we've got a, uh, a small stand and sponge, the instructions, some stickers, um, some screws and an allen key for fitting tips and a couple of cables. So um, the D60 has a type C connector on the back of it for power input and using that we can adapt that into, uh, into various things. So we can plug a uh, type C power delivery um, adapter directly into that and get power in. Um, it also comes with this type C to barrel jack adapter which then allows us to connect up various other DC supplies such as um, 19 volt laptop chargers that kind of thing um, or just bench power supply inputs and likewise it also comes with this barrel jack to XT60 adapter so if we combine these together we now have a type C into XT60 and I can hook up a LiPo battery like this one, um, just a standard hobby LiPo battery with an XT60 connector on it. And now we have a battery operated soldering iron, which is very cool. And the fact that you can run these irons from a battery supply like this is one of the reasons why I really like them. It's one of their coolest party tricks, which it's not something you're going to need very often, but it's really cool to have on hand. Just so if you've got a bit of wire that's just not on your bench and you're like, I need to solder this, it might be in your car, it might be over on the other side of the room, it might be at home and you don't want to take everything home, you can have a highly portable soldering station in in the in your pocket basically. So that's what we get in the box. Now what I'm going to do is um, uh, I've got uh, another one of these LED heart kits, I've got a bag of these in fact, and I'm going to start putting one of these, one of these together and I'll tell you more a bit a bit more about this iron, what I like about it, the disadvantages of it, and also just why I like these electronic irons in general. So to put the tip in this, we pull back the rubber grip, which reveals these two screws on either side. And now we can use either the Allen key that came with it or a T6 screwdriver just to back one of those out slightly and slide the tip in. Now these tips are fairly universal across these um, electronic soldering irons. So um, the tips from the TS100 for the pine sill, um, for the other secure um, soldering irons, and I believe Heiko tips as well, all fit in these irons. So there's a massive selection of tips available to choose from. Um, so this is really great if you're getting into repair and such, uh, because you can just um, the TS100 tips in this style, they are incredibly cheap. So you can have a selection available and try different ones out and see what works for you. And you'll also find that different work tips work in different scenarios as well. So um, what I'm going to do now is I'll just start tipping this out. And um, for simplicity, I'm just going to be running the iron on a 19 and a half volt laptop charger today. And that gives it um, almost full power. Uh, in fact, the manual does actually tell us what the power levels are. Uh, let's see, here we go. Um, so in the manual, at 19 volts, we get 40 watts of power. Um, if we can give it uh, tw the full 24 volt input, then we get 60 watts, and that reduces our heating time fairly considerably. Um, and uh, the same goes for the lower wattages. If you, run, if you do run this from a LiPo battery, 
um, you're going to want at least a four cell. You can run it off a three cell, but you're going to dip down toward the 17 watt range. And you're going to find that it's really only just good enough for touching stuff up at that kind of power level. Um, a four or five cell battery is what you really need. Um, uh, but yeah, 19 volt ch charger will give us 40 watts of power. And that's more than adequate. That's what I use on these irons most of the time. And it's only when I'm really working on something hard where I find that I need to actually put on the, tw the full 24 volt input. And usually if I need that, I'll usually hook up to a DC bench power supply or something like that. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to quickly sort out some of these components so I can put it, everything together. Now, if you're learning to solder, buying these little soldering kits like this, they're incredibly cheap from places like AliExpress, Banggood, um, and there are a couple on Amazon, but they're not the cheapest place to get them from. They're incredibly cheap from China, and they're a really good place to get some practice down. That's a 22 ohm resistor. And I'm just gonna quickly sort through these parts so I can pick and place them. 280K. That's 10k, and that is whatever we need three of. There's a surprising number of people who are interested in computers who have never picked up a soldering iron before, and um, I highly encourage you guys to get yourself a cheap iron like the D60. Um, get yourself a couple of these kits, just buy a selection, and just start putting stuff together. You don't necessarily have to have a goal in mind. Um, just build stuff for the sake of building it. Look for things with LEDs on it, things that light up and make noises. And what we can do now is we can just stick that guy in there and we'll be able to start soldering it on. Now the iron has a couple of settings that we can enter into using the buttons on it. Um, if, we, um, uh, if we press the A button it will start heating. If we press the B button, uh, oh we've got to long press it, there we go, we can start going through the settings on it. And there are only a couple of settings. D1, that is the sleep setting. Uh, long press. Oh, there we go. Um, so we can set this between 1 and 10 minutes, I think. Oh, 1 and 30, I think it goes to. Yeah, there we go. So this is the sleep timer. And this is how long the iron will sit idle for before it automatically goes to sleep. I generally recommend having this on a fairly low setting myself. Um, so that means that if we leave this for 60 seconds without touching it, it will automatically sleep and go into cooling mode. Um, and then when you pick it up, it will automatically sense the movement and heat back up again, which is very handy. Uh, then the next menu setting is compensation. So if you happen to have a, um, a accurate thermometer that can check the temperature of the tip, you can adjust the temperature reading on here to match whatever your um, calibration says. So you can go for more accurate temperatures. In my experience, this isn't terribly necessary, but if you happen to have the equipment for it, then go for it. And then finally, we've got the operating temperature, which, um, whoops, which I've currently got up at 400. That's a bit overkill for what we're doing today. So I'm gonna set that to uh, 370, I think. There we go. And then that will save, and that's going to go back to here. So where it's sitting on 25, this is currently just the idle temperature of the tip. So now if I press the A button, now you can see we are heating. So now the display is climbing up, and we are heating up to operating temperature. And just for the reference, that flickering you can see, this is just the multiplexing of the display. The camera can see this, but to the naked eye, the display is very static. It's quite bright, although it does need a bit of, it needs a little bit of tint on there just to make it a little bit more readable. It looks okay on camera, but you know, you can see I can get that to certain angles where it's not the easiest to read in the world. But, you know, we're nitpicking here. So now we're up to operating temperature, we can actually start soldering. So the great thing about these irons is um, with the adjustments on there, you can very easily change your temperature for what you're working on because if you're working on small projects like this, you don't need a lot of temperature at all. Let's give you guys a close up. As you can see, at 370, we just cut straight in there and start flowing solder in place. This particular kit has really small solder pads on it, uh, which means that I'm having to run quite a lot of solder on the tip to get that to flow nicely but that's okay. Yeah, 
No? Okay, I'll just give it some more then. There we go. And if we find ourselves needing the extra temperature because we're working on, say, a laptop motherboard and we hit a ground plane or something, we can just press the buttons here and adjust the temperature up on the fly. It tops out at 400 and there are other irons that can go higher than this, but in my experience, most of the tips that you're likely to use in these irons won't go much past 400 anyway. I think the most I've seen is 410, maybe 415, and at that point you're just ragging the tip. Really, 400 is arguably a bit raw for uh, these irons. However, if you do want to work on heavy motherboards, you're going to need that 400. However, they can do it, which is what I like about them. These are very cheap irons that can be used for very advanced repairs. I'll put in this switch now, if I can figure out which way around it goes. And these things are so quick to heat up that you, there's just no sitting around. When I first started soldering, I was using just a, you know, runs off the mains um, uh, iron that you would get down at your local electronics store with no temperature control or no interchangeable tip. And it took it about 10 minutes to warm up. And it was just generally not a pleasant experience. And it didn't give me any kind of passion for soldering. But as soon as you get these irons, you have it. They're so quick to get up and go, and they've got so many options available to them that just suddenly you realise that the world of soldering that you see on YouTube is actually a lot easier to get to than you thought. And as with all hobbies, it's um, very much a case of easy to get started in, difficult to master. But the easy to get started in is the important bit because it gives you that confidence to actually have a go at stuff. I see lots of people who are fairly unwilling to do any kind of computer repair. Uh, where's my cutters? There they are. I see lots of people who are fairly unwilling to do any kind of computer repair that requires any kind of soldering, because as soon as they see that soldering required um, tag, immediately they just switch off and go, I can't do that. But you can, and it's really not expensive to do so. And starting out on these cheap kits and a cheap iron makes it accessible. And it means that you don't have to invest, uh, you know, hundreds of pounds or hundreds of dollars into super expensive high brand equipment, which you don't know if you'll need or if you'll even be able to use effectively either. There we go. And if I want to make that a little bit straighter, I can just heat up all three of those at the same time whoop, and just straighten that out. Now I'll just pull out the bridge that I put in. Redo that bottom leg. Put in a new bridge. Pull it out again. <laughs> Find that it's not straight anymore. Good grief, let's just cut them off and then flow them again. That'll work better. There we go. Here's a little trimmer pot that adjusts the speed of the blinking that we're going to get. While I'm putting these resistors in, you can just see how where the iron is idling, it's now automatically gone to sleep, so it's now cooling down. And that's going to drop all the way down to 100 degrees. So when I move the iron and it wakes up again, it doesn't have to wake up from stone cold. It's only got to recover from 100 C, which will be very quick. And now as soon as I pick up the iron again, it automatically starts reheating for me. So 
So while I start putting in these LEDs, I will tell you a bit more about the cost and downsides of the D60. So uh, the D60, as the pack that I have here, which comes with the accessory cables and the little stand and stuff like that, comes in at 37 US dollars directly from the SecureMall website. And there'll be a link to that down below that'll be an affiliate link if you want to buy one of these. And that price is reasonable for what you're getting. Um, because it comes with the cables and accessories, that's about correct, I would say. Um, you can get similar irons um, for around about the same price. And if you're seeing more expensive kits, they will usually include a power adapter and things like that as well. If you want to get something that's a little bit more advanced with some extra features like a OLED screen um, and boost control and upgradable firmware and stuff like that, uh, Secure also have um, a more expensive iron, which is the SQ001, which is basically a TS100 clone. And the TS100 is a very venerable iron itself and also very good. I actually have a TS100. It was one of my first uh, electronic soldering irons. I'll just straighten out these LEDs before I solder the other legs on them. However, there's a problem. The pine sill exists. This is the Pine 64 pine sill, which is also, it's not a TS100 clone, it has a different design. However, the feature set is functionally identical to the TS100, and it can even run exactly the same um, open source firmware. Um, however, it has better connectivity on the back with a better power delivery compliant type C port and a barrel jack, which means you need fewer adapters to use this iron and of course, the better OLED screen. Now, it's easy to say, okay, well, we're now comparing it against a higher tier soldering iron. This thing goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the SQ001. The problem is, is that this guy is $27. So this is a class above the D60 while costing less than the D60 does. Now, granted, if you do buy it with the same accessories, if you want to get it with the natty little stand and a, uh, a Type-C cable for it as well, you're probably going to get up to, you know, $35 or so, approximately the same price as the D60. But we're still talking about a um, an iron that has significantly more features in it. Uh, those features do include, you know, boost mode, uh, automatic sleeping when you put the iron down in a holder, and so on and so forth. Um, but the catch there is that the Pine Sill, um, Pine 64 are industry disruptors. They're making lots of weird and cool gadgets for seemingly impossible prices. But the catch with that is that they're only in stock sometimes. Um, so that might be what actually changes your mind on which you get. Because while I have to honestly say that I would recommend a Pine Sill over the D60, although you could use both, the Pine Sill will be in stock sometimes. So it really comes down to a fact of if the Pine Sill is in stock, that's honestly what I would recommend buying. However, uh, if the Pine Sill is not in stock or if they can't ship to you, then the D60 will be in stock and can be shipped to you. And if you're in Asian countries, it's even available with free shipping as well. And that's a tough deal to beat. And while I say that the Pine Sill has got additional features, there are no features on the Pine Sill that I would honestly say are mission critical. Um, you know, the way that I'm using this iron right now is purely just as an adjustable iron with removable and interchangeable tips. And that's honestly what I actually need from a product like this. Everything else that the higher tier irons can do is more of a convenience factor or just simply party tricks. Right, I'll get the rest of these LEDs plugged in and then we can see it in action and wrap up. There we go. As a last finishing touch, I've got a USB cable here that I chopped off of an old keyboard that I was throwing out. So I've just 
spliced out the red and black wires from there and soldered them onto the positive and negative terminals. And now we can just run this off of any USB power bank. So let me just grab one of those. Aha! Look at it go! That's it. That's what we did. That's what we achieved. We made a heart that glows. So that is the secure D60 electronic soldering iron. And uh, I can honestly recommend it as a viable iron. It does everything that my other soldering irons, including my pine saw and my TS100 can do. And those are the soldering irons that I use in all of my repair videos. I'm not gonna say that these things will go toe to toe with the top end hacko. Um, you know, when you really get into top end micro soldering and stuff like that, you're gonna start running into the limitations of these irons. However, they are a really low cost, high convenience way to get into doing electronic soldering. And they're so convenient with the variety of ways that you can power them and the variety of ways that you can move it around and use it on the go that I think it's a no-brainer to have one of these in your toolkit, even if you already have another soldering iron that's got a big old base station on it. So thank you very much for tuning in, everyone, and I will see you guys in the next video.